These are the Black Hills, land sacred to the Sioux Native Americans and home to Mount Rushmore. This beautiful but contentious swath of land in western South Dakota has caused the U.S. government to break multiple treaties, which sparked protest movements for over a century that persist through today. Contemporary protests in the Black Hills are connected to the history of the American Western frontier and the Broken Treaty of 1868, which was shaped by 19th century art that portrayed the West as an untamed virgin land which Native Americans would passively watch get cultivated, like in this piece here. 19th century art that dehumanized Native Americans and economic incentives like the gold rush will help us understand why the U.S. broke the Treaty of 1868. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, displacing nearly all Native Americans east of the Mississippi. For the Sioux, that meant leaving their Minnesota territories and being constricted mostly to modern-day South Dakota, closer to their sacred lands of the Black Hills. However, the California Gold Rush of 1849 incentivized white settlers to move west of the Mississippi, creating trails like the Bozeman Trail through government-acknowledged Sioux land. Needless to say, the Sioux were not happy, but the U.S. government attempted to avoid further strife by negotiating the first Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1851, which allowed the U.S. to build roads through Sioux territory, but it also offered Indians protection through rations, farming equipment, and other basic goods. This painting commemorating the signing of the treaty conveys the same message of fairness that the treaty feigned but never lived up to. The idea that there were two equal parties negotiating a fair deal is a historical fiction that was enabled and bolstered by works of art like this. The treaty painting, for example, shows really a kind of romantic portrayal of a dignified land exchange and sugarcoats a lot of this story and completely excludes the understanding that this was a horrible time for Native people. At this point in time in the 1850s, Dakota people had almost no options. It was like, this treaty, get nothing. <laughs> and, that, and once you have sort of that limited options, those few options, it really can't be something that we would call uh, a session. It's really more of a seizure. And so I often will call them land seizure treaties. According to the treaty, the Dakota were to cede 35 million acres of land at 12 cents an acre in exchange for roughly $4 million to be paid over time. However, the Dakota Sioux never received this money. When they were signing the documents, they had to sign two copies of the treaty, and then they were led to sign a third document prepared by the traders. This document had not been explained to them. Many thought it was simply another copy of the treaty. Instead, this document determined that the monies promised the Dakota for their land would go to the traders for supposed past debts. To add insult to injury, the government didn't even hold up their end of the treaty. Mismanagement of Sioux annuities was so egregious that the Sioux were suffering from starvation by 1862. In a series of sometimes bloody campaigns against settlers and U.S. troops who were violating the Fort Laramie Treaty, Sioux soldiers looked to defend the land that they saw as not only theirs, but also incredibly sacred. As news spread of Indian campaigns against whites, paintings at the time increasingly portrayed Indians as ruthless savages who would stop at nothing to kill. These paintings, of course, like Cam Weimer's attack on the emigrant train, did not provide context for these scenes, such as the treaty violations that prompted what the Sioux would call defense of their lands. Another is Theodore Kaufman's Railway Attacked by Indians, where the only context the viewer has is that seemingly malicious Indians are getting a kick out of derailing a train full of innocent passengers. The context here is the Pacific Railroads Act of 1862, which confiscated more native land. Under pressure to secure peace in the plains, the U.S. government gave a treaty with the Sioux a second go-round in 1868, 
which determined that the Sioux would permanently settle in the Black Hills, creating the Great Sioux Reservation that exists to this day. The agreement stated that the Black Hills would belong to the Sioux for as long as the grass shall grow and the rivers will flow. But in the blink of an eye, just a few years after the treaty was signed, word got out that there was gold in the Black Hills. The man who broke the news to the nation was General George Armstrong Custer, who had led an expedition in the Black Hills in 1874. By the summer of 1875, the Black Hills had become overridden with the gold miners, who had continued to settle into the turn of the century. The Sioux were deeply troubled and waged a revenge against Custer and his men in the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1877. Since then, though the Sioux have had some victories in court, civilian, corporate, and government actors continue to violate the Treaty of 1868 by excavating the Black Hills in one way or another. Now, of course, economic incentives are a driving force. But 19th century art that peddled skewed narratives about native people also gave encroachers a moral license to breach the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868.